Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my talk. It's scheduled in the program for 30 minutes, but this room is actually free for about an hour and a half. So although I talk fast, I'll probably take about 40 minutes. And then there'll be some question and answer time afterwards, and there'll be some specimens down here at the front that people can come and look at. But if you do need to dash off somewhere after 30 minutes, or you're just bored, please do feel free to leave, um, and I won't be insulted. Can we lower the lights? Can we lower the lights, please? Yeah, thank you. Today I aim to introduce you to the geology of Italy and how its geological history has shaped the country we know today. So even though it's dark, can you put your hands up, please, if you've ever been to Italy? Great. And keep them up there. Keep them up there if you've had a good visit, you've enjoyed it, you like Italy. Even better. So hopefully there'll be something in this talk for everyone. So whether you enjoy skiing in the Alps or in the Dolomites, or you enjoy visiting the Apennines and looking at these hilltop towns or the towns perched on the cliffs, such as this one, Vernazza, in the Cinque Terre in Liguria. Or maybe it's the architecture and art, or Pompeii that inspires you. I hope that whatever these aspects of Italy interest you, I hope that by the end of today's talk, you will have gained some insight into how the geology of Italy has helped influence and form these things. Now, geologically speaking, the landscape of the UK, as we know it today, is rather old and somewhat boring. Nothing much has happened to the UK in the last 200 million years, except for some exciting volcanic activity that took place in Scotland and Northern Ireland about 60 million years ago. But 60 million years ago, Italy didn't even exist. The Alps were mere low hills. Now I know millions of years, for those of us that work on minutes and hours, is a difficult concept to comprehend. So as geologists, we tend to use this analogy. Let we say, let's say the birth of the Earth to today is 12 hours. So the Earth was formed at midnight, right up here. And the last sort of volcanic activity that took place in Scotland was about here, 65 to 55 million years ago, five minutes to midday. And we're sitting here today in midday. And that's also when Italy started to form. So just think of a 12-hour clock. And if I talk about 60, 68 million years, it's only something like five minutes in the age of the Earth. If I talk about 10 million years, it's less than a minute. So that'll just get you your reference frame. Not only is Italy geologically very young, it's also geologically very active. It's prone to large numbers of earthquakes. And this is the most, re well, the second most recent earthquake that hit Italy in 2009 and destroyed the center of the city of Aquila. The only other two countries in Europe that have some, some about similar amounts of seismicity to Italy are Greece and Spain. And another way Italy is unique in the Mediterranean, it's got lots of volcanic activity. And no other country has as many active historic volcanoes as Italy. And many of you, I'm sure, will be aware of one of the most um, important volcanic eruptions that took place in modern human history, in a way, the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79 that destroyed the Roman city of Pompeii. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So to get started, let's have a look at the geography of Italy. We'll use this satellite image, and I'm sure all of you have visited will be familiar with these main features. The Alps up here, covered with snow, form the northern boundary to Italy. In between then, there's a low valley called the Po Valley, and then there's another chain of mountains that dominate the whole central peninsula, known as the Apennines, and they continue all the way down into Sicily. 
And south of Rome, from Naples, Vesuvius, all around through the Aeolian Islands and to Mount Etna in Sicily, is a chain of volcanoes. And as geologists, we refer to those as the Calabrian Arc. And the two seas that I may refer to is the Adriatic Sea on the eastern side of Italy and the Tyrrhenian Sea on the western side. Now, geologists prefer to look at maps such as this. This is what we call a topography map or a bathymetric map. So topography is just the height above the ground, and the bathymetry is just the depth beneath the sea. And we prefer to look at this because, if you like, it's the skeleton. We've taken off all the skin, the crud of the houses, the buildings, the grass, the fields, and we can get some insight into the geological or the tectonic framework of the land we're interested in. So again, we see the Alps forming the highest topography in Europe, rising up to heights of 3,000 meters in the center. The Apennines also some quite high mountains, extending all the way from Liguria down through Calabria and into Sicily. And again, these two seas on either side. The Adriatic, you'll see, is very shallow. And in fact, it's just a drowned bit of continent. On the other hand, the Tyrrhenian Sea is much deeper, goes down to 4,000 meters, and it's a very, very young sea. Parts of it only formed about 4 million years ago. And again, as I was pointing out, oops, sorry. Again, as I was pointing out earlier, one more back, you can see these um, islands sticking out from the sea around here, and these are the volcanic islands that make up this Calabrian arc. Now, the most important feature, it's a bit faint actually on this slide, do you see this orange dashed line I've put in here? And that represents the boundary between the African plate and the European plate. So, I said to you that Italy is geologically very young and very active. And the reason for this is because it straddles a very, very important geological boundary, and that is a plate boundary. So for the last 150 million years or so, the African plate has been moving northwards towards the European plate. And in doing so, it's consumed an ocean in between, an old ocean that we refer to as Tethys. And in doing that, it formed the Alps and the Apennines and gave Italy this shape. Now, all of this bit of Italy south of the Dolomites was once part of Africa. So the Dolomites were shallow seas on a large promontory that stuck out from Africa. And the rest of the Alps all the way around to here was part of the European plate. So our story today will be largely how this happened. But before we go into that in detail, you need to refresh your memory about rocks. Okay, so here we go. Geologists identify, or we organize rocks in three main types. So we have sedimentary rocks, things like sandstone and mudstone, made up of the sediments that come down from the mountains, rivers, and get transported onto plains and down into the deep sea. We then have igneous rocks, igneous fire in Greece, so they come from the molten interior of the earth. They come out to the surface it, through volcanoes and make lavas and form basalts. And then the third type of rock are metamorphic rocks, so metamorphic to change. So they are originally sedimentary rocks or igneous rocks that in some way have got baked, if you like. They've got taken to great pressures, maybe down to 10 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface, and have been heated up to temperatures above 200 degrees. So that's why we like the analogy that they're baked. So here are an example of some sandstones and mudstones. And I hope just about you can see, at least if you're in the front, can you see that that looks a bit grainy? You could imagine rubbing your hand on that rock that you could feel the grains of sand. And that's why we call it a sandstone. In comparison, these, this layered rock here with these laminations in it is much more fine-grained. And if you were to cut it up, it would just crumble like mud or clay. 
And why I've used this particular example of a sandstone is because it occurs throughout the northern Apennines, and I have a sample of it here that you can come and look at later, and it's used as one of the main building stones in Florence, the famous Pietra Dura. So then, what are limestones? So limestones are another type of sedimentary rock, but this time they come from bits of shells, from living organisms that have died and the shells have rained out onto the bottom of the sea. And they are also chemical precipitates of calcium carbonate. And they tend to form in warm tropical seas. So where you've got nice warm seas where you build coral reefs and have lots of um, shells and various different fossils and fish living is where you tend to get um, limestones forming. Now this particular set of rocks here are some red limestones and they're known as the Ammonitico Rosso. Ammonitico is ammonite in Italian, which anybody who's been to Dorset will know, very famous on the south coast of Britain, all the Jurassic ammonites. So these are some more Jurassic Cretaceous ammonites. This is from the Ammonitico Rosso, and there's the rod, red rocks behind. And to give you a feel for the size of that little cliff, there's one of our students. You can just about see him hiding behind the, the, the bushes with a helmet on, and we take hard hats when we go and look at rocks like this. But most of the limestones in the Apennines are actually white. And the, if you've ever gone walking in Umbria, the Marche, Molise, any of those areas, the high peaks that you might have climbed are made of white limestones. So they're just another form of limestones rather than these red ones. And the other very important um, carbonate rock that we need to think about when we're thinking about Italy are dolomites. The very first image I showed you were some of those spectacular peaks from the Italian dolomites. And in fact, that area, the man who first discovered the, this mineralogy or the, the, the components of this rock gave his name to both the rock and to the mountain chain. And dolomites are very similar to limestones, but the only difference is that rather than being calcium carbonate, you take the element magnesium and just put that in the crystal instead. So they're very similar. And again, they often form as chemical alteration of limestones. So in fact, the dolomites in northern Italy, we think were originally limestones, and they formed in warm tropical seas about 200 million years ago. So this 500 meters of cliff in the eastern Dolomites, all these layers are beds and beds of old coral reefs and shelly deposits in warm tropical seas, beautiful places to swim in, that got buried slowly over time. And now, due to the forces of the plates colliding, have been lifted up and are there for us to walk around and enjoy in the scenery in the Dolomites. Igneous rocks, and I'm sure everybody in the audience knows about volcanoes. So I won't spend too much time on this. So we call magma the molten rock under the ground. And if it freezes in a magma chamber, it makes large crystals. And that's where granites are formed. But the thing that we're most excited about normally is when the magma comes out to the surface, up through the center of the volcano, up through a vent, out of the caldera. And if it runs down the sides of the mountain, it makes a lava flow. And when that lava freezes, it makes basalt. And at the end, I have some lovely samples here of some lavas that you can come and look at and feel them. So you don't have to go to Etna or Hawaii and stand on hot, burning rock, and get your feet burnt. You can come and try it here in the safety of Imperial College. And the other important things too, sometimes these volcanic eruptions are very explosive. Lots of ash, gases, bits of lava get thrown into the air and they make ash falls or tufts. And I have some samples of those as well. So the last type of rock, do you remember what I said it was going to be called? Metamorphic. Wow, you're paying attention. Brilliant. <laughs> so, and I said this already. Basically, you apply heat or pressure, you bury rocks to over 200 degrees C, or you bury them to the depths of about 10 kilometers. And the places we see metamorphic rocks now are in the center of mountain ranges, where they've been uplifted and exposed for us to see. 
One of the most common types of metamorphic rocks that you find will be something like this, a garnet schist. They're found throughout the Alps, Elba, Sardinia, and Calabria. And why they're called garnet schists is because these reddy brown minerals are garnets. And the speckly silvery stuff are micas. So if you think about putting together the individual components of a cake, you might have some currants, you might have um, flour, butter, sugar. Once you bake it, you subject it to temperature, you can't see the original flour, sugar, and butter. It's turned into cake, and you might see the raisins. And they'll have changed. They'll have become hard or changed their shape, their flavor. So in a way, this is what a metamorphic rock is. That originally could have been a sandstone and mudstone, like the one we saw right at the very beginning. And now it's produced garnets, which means it's been to about temperatures of 300 degrees centigrade. Now, what happens to a limestone? We've seen that a lot of Italy is made up of limestones. So when you collide two plates and the limestones go into mountain belts and get buried, they get changed into marble. And these, there are some particularly famous, well, let me start. Marbles, you find them particularly in the Alps and also in a, one bit of the Apennines, the Alpi Apuane, which are a little bit of the Apennines in Tuscany, to the north of Florence and behind Pisa. And these are very, very famous for a particular type of marble, Carrara marble, which has been prized by builders and artists for making sculptures since Roman times. And if any of you have driven from Genoa or taken the train all the way down to Rome on the western side of Italy, you may have passed two towns known as Massa and Carrara, and it seems as though half the mountainside has been taken away and it's formed by these giant quarries of marble. So if you think about the Dolomites, we saw lots and lots of different beds. This rock, in comparison, is entirely, more or less, entirely homogeneous. Very tight, crystalline, sugary texture. And it sort of sparkles under the light. So those of you that want to come and look later, I've got lots of samples of Carrara marble. So that's some of the mountains in the Alto Apuane with these large marble quarries. Now, actually, they're having to tunnel into the mountain. So rather than taking away the whole mountain, they're now leaving the outer shell and, for environmental reasons, actually tunneling inside, making big quarries in through the center of the mountain to get these marbles out. There's one of these quarries that some of my students were mapping in a number of years ago. So quite large, and you can see these enormous blocks. So you can imagine if you're a sculptor wanting to choose a really nice piece of marble to carve, you can get a very homogeneous large block, about three, four meters high in size, that is relatively the same color. And it gives you a nice pure material to work with. And the other reasons that um, sculptors particularly like Carrara marble is because of its homogeneous texture, and it has very little banding or fabric. So if you work with wood, you worry about the grain, don't you? If you're trying to carve wood, you have to go with the grain or against the grain. And similarly, if you're trying to carve stone, if it's got lots of different layers in it, it makes it very difficult. The rock might break when you don't want it to. And so Carrara marble is particularly special because it's pure calcium carbonate. Now, yes, here we go. So what is this picture on the right is a wafer-thin slice of rock. So I don't know if you can see. I've got, uh, this is a thin section, which is a wafer-thin slice of rock, which is about 30 microns thick. So we grind it down to make it 30 microns and shine light through it and look at it with a microscope. And these are the individual grains. So this is the baked limestone, if you like. And it's completely recrystallized to make an interlocking texture. So it makes it a very hard but homogeneous material that you can carve. So now let's look at some architecture. Those that you have seen, those of you that have seen the wonderful Renaissance facades of churches and special buildings in Tuscany, perhaps in Lucca, Pisa, Florence, this example of the Santa Maria Novella. The reason why the architects 
used these colours was because these are the local rocks found all around them within 100 or 200 kilometres of Tus in Tuscany itself or from Florence or Lucca or Pisa. And I've shown you most of these rocks, so you now can identify them yourselves. So let's take a look at that panel up there and zoom in. So the white rock, that's the easiest one, it has to be Carrara marble. The red, this pinky stuff in here, is the famous Ammonitico Rosso. And I haven't really told you about the green rocks. The green black rocks used as the facing and around the edges is an igneous rock, and it's a little bit of oceanic crust, that old ocean tethys that's been stuck up into bits of Liguria and Tuscany, and you can find it scattered around through various hillsides. So why we have this beautiful um, art that we can go and enjoy is so much a function of the building stones that the architects and those designing things could find all around them in their home countryside. Michelangelo um, is one of the most, well, is probably the most famous sculptor of the Renaissance, and he is particularly prized working with Carrara marble, and he was unusual amongst artists of the time that he actually travelled with his own cart and horse from Florence to Carrara to choose the individual blocks of marbles for his work. And I, as a geologist, am completely humbled by the fact that he could make this rock look lifelike and produce those wonderful folds of material as on the Virgin Mary in the famous Pietà in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And the other, the other series of his sculptures that I really love and speak to me, I think, as a geologist, are his series of captives or prisoners, the unfinished sculptures that line the corridor up to looking at the David, the famous Davide in the Accademia in Florence. And these are unfinished, so this is Atlas. And what I love about this is, as a geologist, I can see the raw marble. I can look at the, lime, the, the limestone, the marble. And then at the same time, you can see how he, the artist, envisaged the human form coming out of that block of rock. The last thing you need to know about, if we're thinking about plates colliding, is what happens when two plates collide. Now, I think you can imagine if you just take the tablecloth and push it together, what's going to happen to it? It's going to fold and rock, isn't it? And the same thing happens with rocks. So these are folds, large folds in the Dolomites. So can you see those layers? There's what we call beds. They were originally deposited horizontally in the sea, and large forces pushing those rocks together have folded them up. So you can track those red layers and see the folds. Now... Sometimes when you fold the rock, it slips and it breaks and then it falls and that's when you get earthquakes. So the other thing that will happen in mountain building is you will get faulting. And this is a nice example of some faults in some red sandstone. So hopefully you again, you can see if we do the same trick, we trace out a line, a bed in here, trace it there, we match it on the other side and we have a break. There's not just a simple fold and that's what we define as a fault. In this particular case, we call it a thrust because one block of rock has been pushed up over the other. So that's all the basic geology you need for the rest of your story. You've got all that, hopefully. Good. So the next thing we'll do now is look at the plate tectonic context. And I'm sure most of you know about this. It's nearly always in the newspapers every time there's a big earthquake a big volcanic eruption, the media show you the local plates or the plates that we have over the Earth's surface. So for geologists, we define the outer rigid layer of the Earth's, of our planet, the Earth, as plates. And that comprises the crust and the upper mantle. And when these move around, so if they move apart, as they're currently doing in the Atlantic, America is moving to the West, Europe is moving to the east, and the Atlantic is getting larger. We make new oceanic crust. However, in other places, like where India is, if the continent is, the plate is moving into another plate, they collide and they make mountain belts. So we're now going to look at what happened to Italy. We're going to start 200 million years ago. Now, there's a lot of detail on this slide, but hopefully, can you see this shape here? 
Does that look like anything you recognize? Africa, perfect. This is North America, and can you spot the British Isles in there? Spain, but look, there's no Italy, no Greece. No, the Mediterranean doesn't exist. So 200 million years ago, so that's, let's say, between quarter two and 10 to 12 in our history, this is what the Earth looked like. We had one large, almost continuous landmass of continents that was referred to as Pangaea, and a large ocean in between here, and this is known as the Tethian Ocean. And these two stars represent, broadly speaking, where it, parts of Italy lay. So this is everything north of the Dolomites and the Western Alps as part of Europe, and this is the Dolomites and all the Apennines, which represented the shallow seas on the edge of the African continent. And if you look where the equator was, look, so you were in the tropics. That's why we have those beautiful limestones that turned into Dolomites, beautiful, warm, tropical seas on the edge of Tethys. It'd be nice to go swimming there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through an animation that will take you from 200 million years ago to the present day, so you can see how the plates move. So I'll do it quite quickly, and then we'll go back and focus on Italy. Okay, here we go. So have you noticed that by about 120 million years ago, we were beginning to form an ocean down here. The North Atlantic had begun to open. Tethys was shrinking and getting smaller, and all these blocks and islands were getting closer together. Here we start opening the South Atlantic and India. Have a look at India now and see what it does. India is zooming northwards and making the Himalayas. Do you see that? It just took off, didn't it? And in the interim, while India was doing all of that, Europe was, Southern Europe and the Mediterranean was beginning to sort of assemble, but you still can't make out Greece. You, can't still, you still can't make out Italy and Southern Spain looks a bit wonky. And there we go, finally, by about 10 million years, you can recognize most of Italy, not the full boot hasn't quite formed. And there we go, at the present day, that's what our current plate boundaries look like. So nowadays, the plate boundary between Africa and Europe is actually located through Calabria and into Greece. But when all of this started, that bit of Italy was part of Africa. Okay, so plate boundaries can change through time. So now, whenever they put, in the, on the newspaper or on the BBC, they show you a map of the plate boundaries and they put a plate boundary right through the center of the Apennines. You know it's wrong. That's where the present day plate boundary is. Okay, so do you want to see that once more? Okay, so we'll zoom backwards. Okay, so here we go. So there we start, off with Tethys. We're moving forward. And we can begin to see lots of islands, so little mini continents, so a bit like, you know, Britain, Ireland, um, New Zealand, lots of different continents, mini or micro continents, still part or, mi or islands as part of Africa and part of Europe, merrily doing their own thing in the Tethian Ocean. But beginning from about this time onwards, Africa is getting closer and closer to Europe. And some of these blocks are amalgamating here, colliding, and this is the start of the Alps. They're beginning to form low hills. But the rest of the Alps, the high Alps, require this bit of Italy, the Apennines, to bang into them. And that doesn't really start happening till about 70, 60 million years ago. And that's when the Apennines started forming. So now take a look. By about 30 million years, bits of the Balkans are assembling, Greece though, and we don't really have Corsica, Sardinia, or the Balearic Islands. They're just this strange bit of land out in that bit of the Mediterranean. And by about 10 million years, we've got most of Italy there, but we don't really have the heel or Calabria, and then that's where we get to the present day. Okay, so now, with that in mind, let's look at the two types of plate boundaries we find in Italy, in the Mediterranean. So first of all, we see continent-continent collision, and that obviously, as you've seen from that little animation, produces the Alps. The other thing we get is, and I didn't emphasize this yet so far, is that whole Tethian Ocean disappeared. 
didn't it? We had a large ocean formed of cold, dense oceanic crust, and it's completely disappeared. It went down a subduction zone. And that's what's happening today in South America. The Pacific Plate, cold, old, dense oceanic crust, is pushed down a subduction zone underneath Peru and Chile. That's why there was that very large earthquake last month, if you remember. And you get lots of volcanoes because the subduction zone goes down, the, the oceanic crust goes down into the mantle, begins to melt, and makes its way up through volcanoes. The other very important thing with a subduction zone is it generates lots of large earthquakes. So as you push hard, cold plate underneath another plate, you get lots of friction and you generate earthquakes, large magnitude earthquakes that extend down to 400, 600 kilometers beneath the ground, deep, dangerous earthquakes. And in the, in the Himalayan alpine type collision, you generate lots of folds and thrusts and you generate lots of earthquakes, but they're diffuse. They're over a much wider area. So now, with that in mind, you can expect volcanoes in Italy and earthquakes in Italy. So that takes us to the next part of our story. This is the second most complicated slide in the talk. So don't worry, Apennines, Alps, Tyrrhenian Sea, Calabria. Now, this is really important. I said that the Tethian Ocean had gone down a subduction zone, but there's still a little bit left of it. There's a little bit of that old 200 million year old Tethian Ocean still stuck in the Mediterranean, and it's being subducted underneath Calabria. And it's being subducted underneath Crete in Greece. And that's why we have all those volcanoes in southern Italy. They're the remnants of that Tethian subduction zone. The crust is still, the ocean crust is still going underneath. It's been melted and it's coming up in these volcanoes that we know in Italy today. And all of this is because Africa is still moving northwards with respect to Europe. So this little arrow here shows you that about since 70 million years to the present day, it's largely been moving northwards. And if we measure the rate, so we want to say how quick that's been doing it, it's been doing it at a moderate eight millimeters per year, okay? So think about that. That's probably your thumb thumbnail in size, that amount in a year, not much. But geologically, that's pretty fast. That's eight kilometers per million years. So if you do a simple sum, that means in about 22 million years, we'll be able to walk from Sicily straight into Africa. We won't have to take a ferry or anything or a boat. We'll just, it'll, it'll all be one landmass. The Mediterranean ultimately will disappear. Okay, so now with that in mind, so now we're going to have a little bit more of a look at these volcanoes. And I've just pointed out really there was Vesuvius, the Aeolian Islands, Etna, but there are quite a few more that we know about, some not active but historically active. And what I've done on this is just put the subduction zone in for you. So there's that Calabrian subduction zone. These are all our volcanoes, and I've drawn three shapes, yellow, blue, and purple. And they represent the zones of earthquakes that take place. Because remember I said a subduction zone doesn't just have volcanic rocks, volcanoes. It also has subduction zone. It also has earthquakes. So these are earthquakes that are shallow. These are earthquakes that are moderately deep. And these are the areas where we have had very deep earthquakes, down to 400 kilometers. Now we can do something quite neat. If we take a section line, so I'm going to draw a line from south of Calabria into the middle of the Tyrrhenian Sea, and I'm going to draw a section through the Earth. So on my x-axis, so everybody knows what their x-axis is, yeah, the horizontal line, I'm going to show that distance. And on the y-axis, I'm going to plot the distance down underneath the ground. And I'm going to plot on that the positions of the earthquakes. And this is what we get. So these are the shallow earthquakes, under the Aeolian Islands, under Calabria, 
These are the deeper earthquakes, 200 kilometers, and then there are the very deep earthquakes under 400 to 400 kilometers. And what does that describe? A subduction zone. So that is our visual, that's the image that geologists and geophysicists use to see, if you like, the subduction zone underneath Italy. That's the most technical we're going to get. Okay, so now let's look at one of those volcanoes, perhaps the volcano that inspires interest in most people in Italy, and that's Vesuvius. So why is Vesuvius special? It has an iconic place in art and study of the Roman civilization. Here's a map of Naples, Vesuvius, Pompeii, Saler Salerno, Sorrentum, Sorrento. And you can see when Vesuvius erupted, this was the cloud of ash, volcanic eruptions, lavas, etc. And unfortunately, Pompeii was on a direct line from the blast. It also has one of the oldest preserved written records of a geological phenomenon. And that was Pliny. Pliny the Younger was writing a letter to Tacitus, who was a very important Roman senator and historian. And he was staying with his uncle. His uncle, Pliny the Elder, was in charge of the Roman fleet in the Bay of Naples. In August, as the eruption took place in AD 79, Pliny the Elder was very worried about some friends of his that lived down here in Stabiae. And he took his, one of his boats out to try and go and rescue them. And unfortunately, the last surge from Vesuvius came and destroyed his boat, and he never made it back. And Pliny, the younger, wrote a description of this phenomenon, which he sent to Tacitus. And it's such a famous, it's an amazing description, because even though we have no video, we have no photographs of this historic event, geologists, we can reconstruct a lot of the information about that eruption from his description. And we've actually given it, he's given his name to a type of geological eruption, a Plinian eruption. And obviously, Vesuvius is still a mo major modern-day hazard. Vesuvius has essentially been erupting for the last 20,000 years. And it, the first and largest eruption was actually Monte Somma. And Vesuvius is sort of like a little baby brother on the side of that original Monte Somma. And then it was very quiet. It didn't do much until about 4,000 years ago. And then this is the Pompeii eruption in here. And again, it was fairly active between 1631 and 1944. And since 1944, it's been quiet. Not much has happened. But if you look at that history, you think and you know it's going to blow up again. But we just don't know when. Interestingly, I'm going to skip that. Interestingly, the Romans had no knowledge that Vesuvius had erupted. For a few hundred years in Roman times, there had been no activity at all on the volcano. This was one of the frescoes discovered in Pompeii at, um, by archaeologists subsequently when excavating. And this is Bacchus on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. And essentially, the Romans had gardens, olive groves, right up to the top of Vesuvius. So they had no idea what was coming to them. It has caused, it has been an object of great interest throughout, um, since Roman times. And this is an interesting sketch or lithograph drawing of Vesuvius by a German scientist, sort of polyglot, really, of his view of what was going on in the center of the mountain. And if you are one of those um, British people who enjoyed going on the grand tour of Italy in the late 1700s, the 1800s, and perhaps were accompanying Turner, this is the sorts of things that you might have seen at night in Vesuvius. So it was a lot more active in those days, had lots of fireworks in the evening. And actually, this is Turner's view of Vesuvius. And it really gives much more of an impression, doesn't it, how those poor Romans must have been feeling in Pompeii and all around when they saw all of that going on in the background. Alas, if you go there today, oh, that's what it did in 1944. We'll skip that. If you go there today, this is largely what you see. The, you can walk right up to the crater, so you can climb. In fact, you can get a bus up to about there. And you just have to walk the last little bit. And you can walk all around the rim. Most days it's like this. But one day when I was there about 20 years ago in January, there was a little bit of gas. So at least that was a bit exciting. 
<laughs> well, as geologists, you know, we want to see some action. All right. And on a more somber note, I suppose, um, you know, this is the modern town of Naples, 20,000 people living that close. So that's Monte Somma, that's Vesuvius, living on the flanks of what we know is an extremely active volcano. Human beings, our memory is very short, isn't it? 1944, it's a long time ago. And people, it's a lovely area. You've got the Bay of Naples, beautiful sea, beautiful weather. And why not build a house closer and closer up the slopes? But beware. OK, the last plate boundary that we have in Italy is the continent continent collision. And we're going to look at the Alps very briefly. Now, this is, again, don't worry about this. It looks complicated. It's what geologists do. They make geological maps with different colors. But the key thing I want you to note is that's that red line we've been using right from the beginning. So this is Africa. There are the Dolomites. That's Europe. So what, what does a section through the Alps look like? Oh, and the dashed lines were just to show you where you find metamorphic rocks in the Alps. So we're going, to take a, a, we're going to look at a geological section, a cross-section from Switzerland into it, and that's what it looks like. Now, don't panic. It's, well, a dog's dinner, or perhaps it's more like marble cake. So anybody that makes marble cake, so when you swirl together the chocolate mixture with the vanilla or the yellow mixture, it might look something like this. So this is the modern-day topography. So if you go through the Gothard Tunnel, if you've been driving down to Italy or Switzerland, it's somewhere in here. This is the modern day topography. And this is what happens when you collide two bits of continent into each other. You fold the rocks really dramatically. And the one thing that's of note here are these black rocks. And I remember I've said that this ocean got subducted, tethys, but how do we actually know it was there? When you collide two continents, a little bit of that oceanic crust, it doesn't all go down the subduction zone, a little bit of it gets caught up in the collision. And we see bits of tethys in the high Alps, which gives us that window into the history. And that's how geologists work, piecing together those little bits of clues to unravel this geological history. So on a more human scale, that's one of these folds. Swiss Alps, the Helvetic Nap. So can you see that band of white rock that's completely folded over? So just think of the Earth's forces. Something, the enormous force to squeeze, you know, rock, solid rock, like this, into enormous folds. And sometimes, as I said before, you break the rock. So here, hopefully, you can see this band of white rock moved over that rock there, so there was a big fold, and it eventually broke through. And then you can get more gentle folds, as this example on the French-Italian border in the French Alps, a beautiful wide fold, but still of significant scale. So the next time you're flying over the Alps, and the weather is good, look for these folds. You'll see them underneath you. And now I come to the very end of my story. I started at the very beginning talking about earthquakes. And now I hope you know why Italy has so many earthquakes. Remember, Africa is moving northwards and has been doing so since 70 million years at that rate of 8 millimeters per year. It's still moving. It's still happening. And Italy is caught in the vice between these two plates. And that generates lots of earthquakes. I realize I've left one of my props behind. Dear me. Too bad. We'll just have to visualize it. OK. So if you notice, there are different color dots, yellow, orange, and red. And they're different sizes. So the yellow ones are tinier, tiny, the orange are sort of visible, and the red are very large. And these represent different magnitudes. So you'll hear in the newspapers or on the radio or on the internet when there's a big earthquake, they'll tell you the size. Magnitude 4, 5, 6, or even more. So what does that actually mean? So magnitude 4, we could consider the, the end, this represents different amounts of energy released. And it's not a linear scale. 
So a magnitude 5 is an order of magnitude more than a 4, and a magnitude 6 is an order of magnitude more again. Now that's quite difficult to comprehend. So one way, useful way, perhaps a, a helpful way maybe, of thinking about this is to just think about it as length. So I had a bright yellow ruler that was 30 centimeters long. So imagine this, this is a yellow ruler. Let's say that's the amount of energy that comes out of a magnitude 4 earthquake. Now, does anybody here know if they're about 1.5 meters tall? Anybody? Yes, very good. We have two volunteers in the audience. So if we stack them on top of each other, so that's going to be me plus another, that's about the amount of energy released in a magnitude 5 earthquake. Now, outside, hopefully you've all seen the Queen's Tower. Yes, the building in the center of Imperial College, our oldest building. That's about 30 meters high. So that's the amount of energy that would be released with this analogy in a magnitude 6 earthquake. So that helps you get the feeling. So basically, the fours are tiddlers. Now, just out of comparison, so this is just the earthquakes in Italy since 1981. These are all the earthquakes, significant earthquakes of magnitude 4 and 4 to 5 in England since 1932. So there's only seven magnitude 5 earthquakes. I mean, it's nothing. So four, a plate might fall off the wall, or it feels like a lorry going by. Five, you might get a little bit of structural damage. Six is when you get really worried. So really, you can see now why I mean the British Isles are a bit dead, whereas Italy is hugely active. <laughs> so, and this is my, yeah, my last slide. So this represents the... Um, the large magnitude historical earthquakes from historical records. So we've gone up a scale. So you can see now these are greater than magnitude 6.5. So these are the really nasty ones. And if we can take about 1,600 or, I've got my maths right, 1,200 years, we can see that the largest earthquakes in Italy really define that subduction zone. But there are still some quite large ones associated with the Alps and associated with the Apennines. So the two most recent earthquakes in Italy, Aquila from April 2009, and actually one that took place in Modena, a slightly smaller one, but still a magnitude 6, are not geologically surprising. As geologists, we would expect them. Modena is actually, for those of you that like balsamic vinegar, that's where balsamic vinegar comes from, Modena. So the whole of Italy is seismically active. So on your next travel, don't be surprised if you feel the earth tremoring beneath you. So I'll end my tour of Italy with this last slide. And I want to rep leave you with these two images. This is um, one of the famous mosaics or pavements, pavimenti, in Venice, where the Venetians, building marvelous places such as St. Mark's, used all the local stones, the stones they could find in the Alps, stones that they could find around the Mediterranean, to build to make these lovely floors. And this is the cellular group in the Dolomites rising up out of the mist. So hopefully, something of what I've told you today, part of my tour around the geology or the tectonics of Italy, will inspire you, perhaps tell you more about the scenery, or give you another view of the art on your next travel to Italy. Thank you very much. Can we have the lights on, please? Can I have lights, please? Great. <laughs> oh, I spoke too soon. Wonderful. Oh. <laughs> now I can see you in multicolor. Great. So has anybody got any questions? Yes. That's actually a very difficult question. So it involves, it would involve quite a lot of geology to explain. And it's difficult to, conver to convert convergence rates into uplift rates. But it's on the order of millimeters per year, because somehow we have to, you know, balance that deformation rate. The plates are moving at millimeters per year, so it's on that order. And what we do modern day is we do GPS and satellite imagery. 
and that we get we can get as the satellites pass over they have they use radar to get ground level and the distance you know between one to five years distance allows us enough difference to actually calculate what that uplift rate is. Um, I don't work on that sort of thing, so I wouldn't be prepared to say. But within millimeters, otherwise, you wouldn't make the measurements. Yes. Um, well, only as far as Italy is concerned, by about 15 minutes of time, the Mediterranean will have disappeared. We will just have a mountain belt. That's all I'm prepared to say. So there will be no worry about whether we're the European Union, whatever. <laughs> we will be forcibly joined to Africa if we're still around to see it. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 potentially the Campo Flegre, more close to Rome and around that area. And actually, if you go up to the lakes just to the north of Rome as well, this is a big problem, you know, as well, it's really the field of volcanology. We always are drawn to what's most active. But if you saw in that history of Vesuvius, there were times of about a thousand Ten a thousand or more years where nothing happened. So it is potentially, there is potential threat there. But in terms of modern human scale risk, the Instituto Geologico Geophysico e, Volc e Volcanologia, so the Italian Geophysical and Volcanological, Volcanological Institute, who, who measures and you know, monitors everything, spend more effort monitoring Vesuvius than they do the Campi Flegri, which perhaps tells us something, but I wouldn't like to say any more, not being a volcanologist. What was the question? <laughs> the question is, is there a more, is the Campi Flegri area, which is around Rome, has a lot of extinct volcanoes, and is that likely to be as important or as great a risk as the Vesuvius area? That was it, yes? So now who was next? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. When I looked into this, um, most of the monitoring actually takes place on the flanks of Vesuvius. So where people are worried about is well, we suspect the magma chamber is you know, beneath the ground, but largely of the dimensions of Monte Somma, so that bigger mountain. Um, and we don't really think that anything's happening underneath the Bay of Naples. But I couldn't be 100% sure because I don't, I'm not really a volcanologist. So the stuff I read about didn't mention that. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the history of geology itself? How, how scientists make these sort of uh, conclusions and make quantitative findings? How much time have you got? Plate tectonics <laughs> is a fascinating subject. Um, well. Do you want to come and talk to, I have a PhD student and another geologist, my husband, who will be on hand to show specimens at the end. <laughs> so maybe one of them will be able to give you a short tutorial in the origin of plate tectonics. It wouldn't be fair just now to, to, answer, to, to take up everybody's time with that. But a very interesting question. Thank you. So that's, you've decided that. Oh, one more. Mm. How far along are we now in terms of modeling that you can, you know, in terms of obviously they set out warnings and in seismology, but they, I, I get the sense that you know, we're still very much sometimes working in the dark about where the next major incident's going to be. We just can't predict it. I'm afraid we just can't. So we do, for example, on the San Andreas Fault. Clearly, it's an area where people are really, really worried about major earthquakes. So we can measure geodetically, like the other gentleman asked about, the rate at which things move. So we can put posts in and we can measure with GPS, you know, how far they're moving. And we know, we know the plate rate of motion along that boundary. So we know what, how quickly the Pacific is moving sort of along up towards northwest America. 
and we know we can calculate the creep rate. So we can work out in centimeters or millions of years how much strain is accumulating on that fault zone. But we don't know when that's going to be dissipated by an earthquake. We just don't know. And I can't see in the foreseeable future how, how geophysicists will, will detect that. I mean, when the strain is building up, perhaps, but it happens at rates that are millimeters per year. And when that moment, when the actual rock will fail. I mean, think about a building. You can predict where the stresses might be as a civil engineer, but can you actually predict the time when that concrete will fail? No. And it's the same problem with the earth, the mechanics. So sorry to be gloomy, but <laughs> yes. Do other planets and satellites like the moon, do they display the same sort of fake technology? Um, the moon doesn't. The moon is dead. Um, dead, well, geologically dead, sort of frozen. Um, and this is where my planetary knowledge dies. Um, I think Vesuvius, no, not Vesuvius, um, oh, the planet Venus is considered to have active te plate tectonics on it. Mars, we think, did, but has now largely died. It doesn't have the same sort of tectonics that we have on Earth. And then as you go into the outer planets, I don't really think they do, and I don't know enough about them. Yeah, I mean, some of the icy planets have, you know, have eruptions of things that take place, but actual plate tectonics with this outer shell, it's a function of the temperature that the Earth, that the whole planetary body started with, and the rate at which it cools, which obviously depends where you are from the sun and the original size that you were. And Earth seems to be somewhat unusual to have that magic set of conditions that give us plate tectonics, give us life, etc. We've strayed off Italy. <laughs> so at that point, I'll, I'll call it to a close, and do feel free to come down and look at some of the samples that we have down at the front. Thank you once again. Thank you.